Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the speakers for our, our next panel on the subject of Lincoln's legacy, race, and 20th and 21st century America. And I'm gonna introduce the speakers uh, uh, individually before their, before their papers, and then we'll have some time for discussion afterwards. Uh, the speakers are okay, we'll go in the order that we're on the program. Uh, which means that our first uh, speaker this afternoon is uh, Robin Spencer. Uh, she's currently visiting endowed chair in women and gender studies at Brooklyn College and is a tenured associate professor in the Department of History at Lehman College. Her first book, The Revolution Has Come, Black Power, Gender, and the Black Panther Party in Oakland was published by Duke University Press in 2016. And also in 2016, she received the Mellon Fellowship at Yale University for her current book project, To Build the World Anew, Black Liberation, Politics, and the Movement Against the Vietnam War. She'll be speaking today on In the Shadow of Lincoln, the Black Panther Party, Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, and the Second Reconstruction. Okay, I wanted to start by um, thanking Vernon and Peter, organizers of this conference. I was so moved to note on the website that this conference was conceived in the spirit of reckoning with Clemson's racial past including the acknowledgement of the convict laborers who built the original campus. I often go to conferences where speakers invoke the indigenous history of the land, and I appreciated the reminder of the bloody landscapes just several generations removed from ours. Uh, we stand on bloody land. We also stand on a history of resistance and the century-long struggle to turn the threads of emancipation into the cloth of freedom. Conferences are less dramatic than pulling down monuments and renaming buildings, but this feels important. So forgive my long-winded, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I want to invoke Manning Marable, author of Race Reform and Rebellion, The Second Reconstruction in Black America, 1945 to, 19, to 1990, a seminal text published in 1984 that I encountered as a graduate student and that pushed me to think about my growing research agenda in the modern black freedom movement, as Bernice Johnson Reagan noted, um, simply or more complexly as a continuation. And I'm channeling my inner Eric, Eric Foner. There's an inner Eric Foner in, in me that comes out sometimes, and um, especially when I'm trying to balance details with big picture frameworks uh, with the goal of clarity, um, and also delivered with a side of storytelling. So hopefully what follows will seem like seeing the recent past with a new pair of glasses. And then finally, I particularly want the students in the room, um, South Carolina Rural Action, the group from Atlanta, to hear me and to see themselves in me and also in this history, all of it, to understand what's at stake because everything is at stake in these historical debates, in these thorny details. Um, in the sinews connecting the present to the past. And of course, to understand that being a historian trumps everything, um, best hobby calling career ever, sometimes tedious for sure, but never boring, and very easily pursued alongside sports aspirations. <laughs> in fact, the sports aspirations might be more lucrative, but one can always um, fuel their inner historian as well. <laughs> so from reconstruction to black power, Scholars have recovered the black power movement from its detractors and minimizers. Declension narratives have receded. Black power is no longer understood as an angry, self-destructive, masculinist deviation to everything that came before. Now understood as a central branch of the long black freedom movement and also distinctly American. Shaped, framed, rooted in the potentials and limitations of American lived experiences, just like the other social movements that sprung up in the post-World War II era. So black power was a counterculture, a new left, a women's movement, an anti-war movement, and yes, even a second reconstruction. So I wanna tell the story of what happened when one of black power's most notorious organizations gathered thousands of people in the most iconic and historic places of American democracy, 
Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, birthplace of the Liberty Bell and the Declaration of Independence, and in Washington, D.C., in the shadow of the Lincoln Monument, with the goal of rewriting the U.S. Constitution from below. The Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention was a diverse public gathering of between 10,000 and 15,000 people who answered the call by the Black Panther Party to gather in Philadelphia on the weekend of September 5th, 1970. Unfinished work was on the agenda. The unfinished work of 1865, and even more profoundly, the unfinished work of 1787. One flyer for the convention argued that the Bill of Rights had not applied to black people. It asked, quote, where is freedom when a people's right to freedom of speech is denied to the point of murder? When attempts at freedom of the press bring bombings and lynching? Where is freedom when the right to peacefully assembly brings on massacres? Where is our right to keep and bear arms when black people are attacked by the racist Gestapo of America? Where is the right to vote regardless of race or color when a murder takes place at the voting polls. The empty promise of the Constitution to establish justice lies exposed to the world by the realities of black people's existence. And of course, these words were contextualized by the many struggles around voting rights um, against segregation that had gone on um, in the early 1960s. Well, that organization was the Black Panther Party. No stranger to audacious and ambitious freedom projects, but oftentimes remembered more for their advocacy and practice of armed self-defense rather than their engagement with fundamental American principles. George Katsiafias has argued that although seldom mentioned in mainstream accounts, this self-understood revolutionary event the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, came at the high point of the 60s movement in the US and was arguably the most momentous event in the movement during this critical period in American history. Yet few have even heard of it. And there's no book about it. Um, there's a few articles about it um, as well. So a few points about this Constitutional Convention. It was held over two days um, the plenary sessions included workshops which divided attendees into groups such as third world peoples, women, GIs, college students, high school students, workers, lesbians, male homosexuals, welfare people, street people, and head workers. Head workers were defined as people's technicians, lawyers, doctors, scientists. Each group was charged with creating a brief statement, quote, describing their grievances and their vision for the new society, end quote, which was to be shared and debated at the end of the day. The next day, attendees went to workshops on topics such as self-determination for national minorities, self-determination for women, self-determination for street people, the rights of children, sexual, sex, sexual self-determination, the family, control and use of the military and police, control and use of the means of production, control and use of the educational system, control and use of the legal system, land, distribution of political power, and internationalism, relations with liberation struggles around the world, religious oppression, and new humanism. One attendee described these workshops as exhilarating political spaces where issues were discussed in a spirit of openness and optimism. Attendees were part of working groups, which brought together the major constituencies of the revolutionary popular movement. It's important to note that attendees were not majority black. They were, in fact, it was a majority white gathering, um, many Latinos, um, other people of color um, as well. Each of the workshops was led by Panther members who also coordinated security contingents to ensure a trouble-free working environment. The media was prevented from attending um, with the Panthers fearing that their presence would only make a circus out of the proceedings. <laughs> 
The Panther's ability to funnel and harass and harness rather the sheer power to envision a new society was a profound act of participatory democracy. Movement luminaries attended like Muhammad Ali, an ordinary participant who shook hands, signed autographs and offered words of encouragement while other people talked to old friends or made new ones as they looked for a place to stay. Alongside an international bill of rights and lofty ideals like the redistribution of the wealth of the world, there were calls for the ban of genocidal weapons, the end to standing armies, and a people's militia. There were demands for police control boards, um, and the idea that the leadership of the police should be chosen by direct popular majority vote of the community. This was one way of addressing the police brutality which had defined the period. Scholars of LGBTQI plus history have argued that the space that the Panthers opened was central to the fueling of their movement. Emily Hobson has argued that gay liberationists built ties to black radicals through a shared challenge to police abuse and one of those ways was by forging alliances with the Black Panther Party. These links accelerated after Huey Newton came out of prison in 1970, and as well when lesbian radicals participated in the Panthers Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. Those links were especially strong in Philadelphia, in part because of the city's Gay Liberation Front, which was a majority people of color. One attendee recalled, suddenly hundreds of gay people entered the upper balcony, chanting and clapping rhythmically, gay power to the gay, gay people, power to the people, black power to the black, black people, gay, gay power to the gay, gay people, power to the people. Everyone rose to their feet and joined in, repeating the refrain and using other appropriate adjectives, red, brown, women, youth, and students. A historian, Robin Kelly, has argued that there's a value in understanding utopian visions of liberation, not judging them for their successes or longevity, but for their attempts to raise the ceilings of our collective imagination of possibility. And also for what they reveal about the social climate and the political vision, especially for radical historical actors. So I can already tell you um, the end of the story, which is not going to be that the Panthers enacted their revolutionary <laughs> people's constitution. Now, why? One of the things to keep in mind is that this convention was held in the midst of police terror and state violence directed against the Black Panther Party. And that this is part of understanding this movement in this time period and the constraints on social movements. Many of the attendees understood their attendance as part of their support and defense of the Black Panthers. Um, thinking about connections, I thought about state sanctioned violence during Reconstruction as well. For the students, if you go online to www.freedmansbureau.com and you click on the link called Murders and Outrages, which is really just the tip of the iceberg and not for the faint of heart. It's not a comparison, but really an attempt to think together the historical dialect of progress and violence and how that plays across black lives in different time periods. In the weeks before people gathered in Philadelphia, police assaulted all three Panther offices in the city, arresting every member of the Panthers that they could find. The Panthers had defended themselves and three police officers were wounded in the shooting. After the police force captured Panther men to walk naked through the streets while being photographed by the press, Police Chief Rizzo gloated that he had caught, quote, the big bad Black Panthers with their pants down. Publicized widely, the atmosphere created by these events were an important part of the aura of the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. There was an element of fear that accompanied the euphoria of trying to bring together an event like this. Many people talked about being afraid to come to Philadelphia. And of course, this is in the context of a time where the Panthers faced the full onslaught of the FBI's counterintelligence program in this period and their mandate to disrupt, infiltrate, harass, and arrest the organization, and not just the organization, but the new left um, and many other types of black nationalist organizations as well. <laughs> 
The FBI used the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention to undermine the potential of the event. They seized on Huey P. Newton's articulation of intercommunalism, a theory that he originated to fuel dissension between himself and Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver. The FBI sent a letter to Cleaver about Newton's speech at the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, centered on intercommunalism. Quote, his pipe dream ramblings about intercommunalism make me think that, and they use the N word, is going crazy, and that ain't no bullshit. The party can't understand that intercommunalism shit, and the people laugh when we try to explain it, end quote. Um, that's from the FBI, a forged letter looking to come um, from someone else to Eldridge Cleaver about Huey Newton. Newton had moved the Panthers into an internationalist direction upon his release from prison. At the Panthers Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, his keynote speech linked the, the situation of poor communities in the US to their international counterparts and developed this ideal of revolutionary intercommunalism. Two years after Global 68 protests rocked the world, set off by the Tet Offensive in January of 1968, to the Panthers, this internationalist imperative um, was central to their ideas. Newton stated that the primary concern of the Black Panther Party is to lift the level of consciousness of people through theory and practice to the point where they will see exactly what is controlling them and what is oppressing them, and therefore see exactly what has to be done, or at least what the first step is. Newton argued that the world system with its interconnected technologies, cultures, and communication systems, really prefiguring ideals about globalization. He said if these systems could be bought under the collective control of the masses rather than of a small circle of super rich administrators, that everyone's needs could be provided for. The world's problems had a potential to be solved. And an individualistic competitive culture could be replaced with a communal culture that could end the prevalence of perpetual war and social chaos. He called this revolutionary intercommunalism. This political theory actively buried by the FBI has been recovered by a new generation of activists and scholars as an illuminating way of understanding the global order. Well, the idea behind the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention was that there was gonna be a two-step process, first drafting and later ratifying the new constitution. After being warmly accepted by the five to 6,000 people who attended the events in Philadelphia, the documents that were produced in Philadelphia were supposed to be circulated, and then a new, new gathering was supposed to be held in Washington, D.C. in the shadow of the Lincoln Monument. The second convention was to consider ratification and implementation of the final document. It was changed, the dates were changed around several times, which led to confusion. And when people, a mass of people did show up to DC, they were sadly disappointed when the convention failed to materialize the follow-up. So the reasons why from human failing to organizational chaos to a cult of personality around Huey Newton to the impact of political repression on the organization uh, kind of derailed the potential of the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. But it's still important to know that this, this happened and important to think through the successes and failures of this movement and what it reveals about how political radicals thought about the types of changes that were needed to address this unanswered question of what would freedom mean in the lives of, of African Americans. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Gerald Poder, who is a professor of history and the Robert S. Friends Professor of American Studies at Lawrence University. Uh, among his, his many publications are the books, The Strike That Changed New York, Blacks, Whites, and the Ocean Hill-Brownsville Crisis, and City of Dreams, Dodger Stadium, and the Birth of Modern Los Angeles. He's currently writing Promised Lands, A History of the American People in the 20th Century, which will be published by Princeton University Press. He'll be speaking today on the intersectional Lincoln, race, free labor, and colorblind democracy in his time and ours. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, and uh, thank you also, uh, uh, Peter and uh, and Vernon, not just for putting this conference together, but uh, for for your friendship uh, to all of us uh, in this room. Uh, and I also wanted to tell you, uh, Peter and, and Vernon, that we're having such a good time here, we're not going home. <laughs> we're just going to stay here and just continue this. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> okay, we, uh, we alluded this morning briefly uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to counterfactuals, and I'll just give you a, uh, a viewer alert that this presentation is going to contain counterfactuals. On the evening of April 11th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln stood at a White House window before a joyous crowd gathered on the lawn to celebrate the surrender of Robert E. Lee's army at Appomattox two days earlier. It had to be a moment of deep gratification for this long-suffering and much maligned man, undoubtedly the most deeply suffering of our presidents, and until almost this very moment, undoubtedly among the most maligned. But now the people of Washington had come to cheer and honor him. Lincoln spoke generally about Reconstruction, promising a more detailed set of plans in the future, and gingerly suggested that certain categories of African Americans be given the right to vote. It was clear victory was at hand. But who had won? And what had won? That was much less clear as Lincoln spoke. The Union had won, of course. Grant had won. Lincoln had won. And one could also say that emancipation and a northern culture of enterprise and growth had won. Beyond these, however, the future was as misty as that April evening. Almost four million freedmen and women had won, of course, because slavery was doomed. But the political and especially economic ramifications of that act would need to be sorted out under most unpropitious circumstances. A northern white population was deeply divided over the question of what rights the freed people were entitled to, with a substantial portion questioning the very nature of their humanity. A Northern Democratic Party, while tarnished by its association with opposition to what was now obviously a popular war, still possessed the power to mobilize a potent constituency. The South lay in ruins, unrepentant and unreconstructed. The victorious Republican Party itself was divided between a left flank calling for a transformation in political and economic conditions in the South and a more numerous and more cautious group of moderates with less defined views of the direction of the post-war South, but whose understanding of rights leaned toward the legal and procedural and not the material and substantive. And then, of course, there was Lincoln. It is impossible to divine the inner thoughts of this complex and elusive man. But as he looked to the futures of those he had helped free and pondered a South without slavery, Lincoln was impelled by a series of principles, beliefs, and impulses that he projected on the conditions that lay before him, filtered through the prism of his own experiences. And as is so often the case, the implications of those principles, beliefs, and impulses clashed, competed, and contradicted. Lincoln believed deeply in human equality, not in an, in, in an inherent equality of ability or an expectation of equal life outcomes, but in the right of every individual, including African Americans, to keep the fruits of what they had worked for and earned. Lincoln held to this understanding of economic equality even before he began to come around to broader understandings of political equality because of his commitment to the idea of free labor. It was one of Lincoln's lodestars, and he articulated it many times, notably during his 1858 debates with Stephen Douglas when he averred that 
while he had no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races, and agreed with Stephen Douglas that the black man is not my equal in many respects, that nevertheless, and Professor Harris used this quote uh, uh, this morning as well, nevertheless, in the right to eat the bread without the leave of anybody else, which his own hand earns, he is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas and the equal of every living man. Free labor, the right to rise, defined Lincoln's life. And Lincoln wanted his story to be every American story, North and South. I've always felt, for example, that the home Lincoln was most proud of was not the White House or even the Kentucky cabin in which he was born, but his two-story home on 8th and Jackson Streets in Springfield, Illinois, because it symbolized his free labor ascension to a respectable professional position. That house meant he had worked, acquired property, and left his humble origins far behind. That house meant the system had worked, America had worked. I want every man, Lincoln said in 1860, to have the chance, and I believe a black man is entitled to it, in which he can better his condition when he may look forward and hope to be a hired laborer this year and the next, work for himself afterward, and finally hire men to work for him. That is the true system. It was Lincoln's hope and that of his fellow Republicans that this would be the trajectory of freed people in the emancipated South. We know, unfortunately, what happened next. A tragic assassination only three days after Lincoln's April 11th speech. A new president whose devotion to free labor principles extended only to white men. A defiant white South determined to preserve its racial cultures and prerogatives as much as possible. Institutions such as the Freedmen's Bureau that did not realize their full transformational potential. Laws and constitutional amendments aimed at conferring legal and political rights, effective for a brief window of time, then eviscerated by redeemed Southern governments, a hostile judiciary, and white terror. And the collective failure of will of most in the North to continue the struggle for change in the South in the face of financial crisis, labor unrest, and a growing, gnawing sense that the South would not change, could not change, at least not then. And most heartbreakingly of all, there developed no systematic and effective program of land redistribution to the freed people. Although in the view of the presentations of professors Petty, Schultz, and Lanham that we heard yesterday, we do see that the story of black land ownership does not move in a single direction and is a more complicated one than we thought, certainly more complicated than I thought. But still, no effective program from the Freedmen's Bureau, which did not transfer lands that had been confiscated from rebels. Not from President Johnson, whose generous pardons ensured that most former Confederates would keep their lands. Not from Congress, which rejected appeals to make land available to the freed people. And not even from General William Sherman's famous January 1865 Special Field Order Number 15, setting aside lands along the South Carolina and Georgia coasts for black settlement and cultivation, most of which eventually wound up back in white hands. Now, land, of course, was no cure for all ills. The freed people also would have required access to credit, to viable markets, and, of course, to both legal rights and political power with which to protect their interests. But land would have at least begun the process of fulfilling Lincoln's free labor aspirations for them, launching them on a journey that would bear at least some resemblance to his own not from rags to riches, but perhaps from rags to independent respectability. All of this, of course, makes Lincoln's death all the more tragic. 
We may console ourselves with the idea that events would have taken a different turn had he lived, that Lincoln would have achieved the metamorphosis in post-war Southern life that we ourselves, from the perspective of the 21st century, desire to see. But perhaps we ask too much from Lincoln. Perhaps we invest him too thoroughly with our own desires, aspirations, and hopes. Lincoln was the product of many contravening forces, and they did not lead him in a single unwavering direction. And Lincoln's devotion to free labor and its implications may well have constrained his responses to the land question in the postbellum South. For Lincoln, the right to rise was based on the dignity of work and the sanctity of its rewards, property. Lincoln, the constitutionalist, had trod very carefully on property rights before and during the war. He was, after all, willing to guarantee the continuance of Southern property rights in human beings, in slavery, in a desperate attempt to avoid secession. And his articulation of the Emancipation Proclamation as an exercise of presidential war power was subject to constitutional legitimization. It's also well known. Lincoln approved Sherman's Field Order 15, but this too was a product of war and subject to ratification and modification. Lincoln was willing to protect human property up to a point, unhappily to be sure, but he was willing to do it. But would he have been willing to extend the idea of ill-gotten gains to real property, even that held by rebels, in the face of his constitutionalism and respect for property rights? The process of land acquisition in the South was deeply implicated in the system of human bondage, and Lincoln, of course, knew this. And he held the egalitarian principles of the Declaration of Independence in highest regard of all. But the land for freed people question, as important as ever faced an American leader and the nation as a whole, forced Americans, North and South, to define equality with uncomfortable precision. How equal did Americans truly want to be? And how equal did Lincoln want them to be? It has been said that Americans have integrated by class as reluctantly as they have by race, meaning quite reluctantly. And the word redistribution, especially when applied to economic resources, to property, has not been a particularly popular one in most eras of American history. In some, to be sure, and among some, quite possibly some of us today, but not with a great many Americans throughout our history to make perhaps an overly broad and unempirical statement. And not, I would maintain, with Lincoln himself. And so I would argue that in his second term as president and in the years after 1869 as the elder statesman of the Republican Party and in the nation, Lincoln would not have been willing to do the things he would have had to do to ensure that the freed people received what was essential to any real condition of equality in a reconstructed America and what Lincoln himself had famously articulated as a national goal at the beginning of the Civil War to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the path of laudable pursuits for all, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. And that, for freed people, meant land. A fair chance in the race of life for all was very close to Lincoln's heart. But would he have been willing to risk a second civil war? And we, of course, know what transpired in the South after 1865 in the face of politically egalitarian measures, to say nothing of economic ones, in order to achieve this? Lincoln did want economic justice for the freed people. But as a fervent American nationalist, he also wanted a reunified nation. It may not have been so much a question of what Lincoln wanted, but what he wanted more. And so it is probable, in my mind, that Lincoln, by the mid-1870s, would have been where so many of his fellow Republicans actually were, whipsawed between a series of competing impulses. 
a desire for some form of economic equity uh, in the South, but also for a stable, reintegrating Southern economy that was safe for Northern investment. A lingering sense of anger at white Southern recalcitrance, at political fraud, at acts of domestic terrorism, but also a sense of exhaustion at the high cost of affecting change in the South, of the amount of blood and treasure already expended and what would have to be expended to protect that change. A belief in the promise of free labor, even in the face of the rising force of post-war industrial capitalism and finance that threatened to make a mockery of it, but also a deference to property rights and constitutionalism. A longing for a new nation, but also for a reconciled nation, even with many of its promises to African Americans left unmet. And an understanding of the centrality of land to African Americans' visions of equality and freedom, but also a fear of the implications of property redistribution in the South for a North in economic turmoil and rent by class and labor strike. And so Republicans, torn as they were between these competing impulses, followed those that served best their own interests. Lincoln, I am convinced, would have too. While again, I understand that land alone was only a start and not a final destination, this was a great American tragedy that continues to haunt us with its terrible ifs today. And I believe it also speaks to the challenges that we face today as we strive to finish, or at least advance, Lincoln's unfinished work of creating a more equal America, the magnitude of which, as we have seen, may have been too great even for Lincoln. Our current challenges are both the same and different from Lincoln's. The deep constitutional, political, and cultural investment in property rights and commitment to markets in so many sectors of our national community remain from Lincoln's time, and they will make the kind of transformative redistribution of economic resources envisioned by our nation's progressive community a particularly difficult undertaking. While America's young are more predisposed to redistributionist economics than any in recent memory, we're all familiar with the opinion polls showing their widespread support for socialism, however we choose to define it. They are also the generation most fiercely devoted to personal independence. And like the conflicting impulses and inner contradictions that I spoke of in regard to Lincoln and his fellow Republicans, one will eventually exert a stronger pull than the other. The devil, needless to say, lies always in the details. And for the young, the romance of the mind and heart may well fall before the imperatives of the act and deed. But there is also now the potential for identity, racial, ethnic, gender, sexual, to fully realize America's egalitarian promise and finish Lincoln's work in our own time. Much commented upon and written about, both in the academy and increasingly outside it as well, the theory of intersectionality argues that intersection, intersecting categories of social division, where no one category of analysis and action is elevated above others, can form the basis for effective collective, political, and social action. Can intersectionality be the way to finish Lincoln's work? Perhaps. But the assumption that there, was, there will rarely be any conflict between these nodes of identity, that they will work together harmoniously, and that any purported choice between them is a false choice, may itself be wishful thinking because when those choices, false or otherwise, have to be made between multiple inter identities, each actor will choose the one closest to their essence, to their sense of self-definition. They will, in other words, do what intersectionalists say cannot, should not, and need not be done. But history, and especially the history of the years we quite fittingly call the age of Lincoln, tells us that they were done. 
Even Frederick Douglass, for example, did so. When presented with a historic opportunity to secure African-American males the right to vote in America via the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, he took it, arguing that women's suffrage, while of course important, was a less pressing injustice to remedy. It was, Douglas asserted, the Negro's hour. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony also made their choices when they prioritized the voting rights of white women over those of black men, splitting the women's suffrage movement in the process. All three of these great reformers, great revolutionaries even, might be viewed as early models of intersectionality. But when the tug came, each found meaning in the comfortable and the familiar. Most of their Republican allies did as well. And Lincoln, I believe, would have too. And so I would caution those today who hope to rely on an intersectional identitarian alliance of the marginalized to utilize the power of the ascendant to complete Lincoln's work and make America a substantively equal nation, a materially equal nation, that those caught in a storm, even the ascendant, usually find shelter with their own. And when they do, intersectional ideologies offer us little assistance. And while a 21st century vision of an avowedly race neutral, free labor nation governed by animal spirits and unfettered markets is a chimera, nonetheless, Americans may not truly wish to be as equal as they say they do. Until they do, Lincoln's unfinished work will remain just that. Thank you. And our uh, last speaker on the panel will be uh, Peter Eisenstadt, who is an independent professional historian and as you uh, all know, the co-organizer of this conference. Uh, he's the author of several titles, uh, including Rochdale Village, Robert Moses, 6,000 Families, and New York City's Great Experiment in Integrated Housing. And as co-author, Visions of a Better World, Howard Thurman's Pilgrimage to India, and the Origins of African-American Nonviolence. His biography, Against the Hounds of Hell, A Life of Howard Thurman, is forthcoming, and he will be speaking today on Howard Thurman to Carl Downs to Jackie Robinson, Integration Reaches Second Base. Hello. Can I guess you can hear me. Um, I just want to say what a privilege it's been to help bring this conference into life. It's been wonderful seeing old friends like Robin and Jerry putting faces on some of the new friends I've made over the last few months through internet. Um, I don't know if the students, high school students are still here, but um, but it was nice they were here. I particularly want to thank Vernon, who, um, when I moved to Clemson six years ago, as sort of a poor wandering historian without visible institutional means of support, was just about the only person at this university who reached out to me. And now he and Jordan have become dear friends. And once again, it's been a privilege to work with them and everybody here in this conference. And to my paper. Um, let's start in Chiraw, South Carolina in 1933. Town near the North Carolina border on the PD River, population then about 3,500. Like elsewhere in South Carolina, and elsewhere in the South, Chiraw was a town in which white supremacy was maintained by the implicit and explicit use of force. That year, Chiraw's soon to be most famous son the musician John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie, then 16 years old, was terrified when the trombonist in his first band suddenly vanished. His disappearance was never solved, but Gillespie and his bandmates assumed he had been murdered by White for some violation of the racial code. Gillespie took this as a sign to, and I quote, get the hell out of Chara, which he proceeded to do, moving north on the road to bebop glory. In the words of another great South Carolina musician, the bluesman, the Reverend Gary Davis, when asked about growing up in his home state, he replied, in South Carolina, they hung colored people when they felt like it. 1933, a plumber in Chirard decided to do something about this. 
He investigated a racial beating in the city, and as a consequence, he was severely beaten by a group of white thugs. This only stiffened his resolve to investigate similar incidents. He started corresponding with Walter White, executive secretary of the NAACP, complaining that we hear that here for the last six or eight months we have had five or six brutal beatings, and there has not been one of them have been arrested, even been arrested for it. We are treated as slaves here in Chira. They have no law to protect our race at all. Thanks to Bird's doggedness, a chapter of the NAACP, an organization then largely moribund in South Carolina, was established in 1939. When it was founded, the new chapter issued a manif manifesto from which I quote, to be set aside as a subject group by social prejudice, government sanction, subject to the dom domination of all and any who assume authority to command is to be robbed of the same native rights which others demand and for which they barter their lives. What the Negro needs is integration instead of segregation. These conditions are exactly opposite. They're to one as each other as pluses to minus. The one affirms, the other denies. All the blessings of life, liberty, and happiness are possible in integration, while in segregation lurk all the forces of destruction, destructive of their values. Let's quickly move ahead to 1967, to Martin Luther King Jr.'s last book, Where Do We Go From Here? King quoted the prominent African-American novelist, John O. Killens. Integration comes after liberation. A slave cannot integrate with his master. In the whole history of revolts and revolution, integration has never been the main slogan of the revolution. The, the oppressed fights to free himself from his oppressor, not to integrate with him. King writes that though Killen's argument has a surface plausibility, in America, liberation cannot come without integration, and integration cannot come without liberation. Because integration is a mutual sharing of power, concluding, I do not see how the Negro will be totally liberated from the crushing weight of poor education, squalid housing, economic strangulation, until he is integrated with power into every level of American life. King writes that he is in favor of integration, but integration was power. It is the thesis of this paper that integration was power is what the early advocates of integration, such as Levi Bird, Levi Bird intended all along, but that the original meaning of integration was largely lost between the 1930s and the late 1960s. I need to follow up this assertion with the necessary caveat that integration, like all complex terms, never had a single meaning. Nevertheless, the main sense of integration to many of his early supporters, such as Levi Bird, is unmistakable. Bird was not advocating race mixing. It, you know, public schools um, were obviously going to be segregated. Assimilation or a middle class black agenda. Integration in Troy had nothing to do with white liberals' efforts to ameliorate the racial tension, and there probably were no white liberals in Chira in 1939. At no little personal risk to Bird and his colleagues, the call for integration was a demand for um, effective black citizenship and a call for sweeping transformational radical change. Integration was a ubiquitous term in the social and physical sciences of the early decades of the 20th century, and from there it filtered into wider usage. Economists spoke of vertical and horizontal integration, psychologists of integration of the personality. Um, its first champion, and a most unlikely hero in this story, is Herbert Spencer, the 19th century evolutionary theorist who is more or less single-handedly responsible for popularizing the term integration outside of the realms of the higher mathematics and recondite systems of logic. The entrance of integration into America's racial vocabulary can be dated with a fair amount of precision. In 1934, W.E.B. Du Bois created quite a furor with a series of articles in The Crisis, the journal of the NAACP, that called for, and I quote, the thinking colored person of the United States 
to stop being stampeded by the word segregation and to embrace it as a positive good and suggested building a vibrant cooperative black internal economy. America, he wrote, was more segregated in 1934 than it had been a quarter century earlier. And for blacks, Du Bois said, it would be idiotic to sit on the sidelines and yell no segregation in an increasingly segregated world. Du Bois' articles sparked a furious debate though the pose to Du Bois' argument had no single term for their position. Assimilation or amalgamation implied a dissolution of black identity. Interracialism was too narrow, tends to be focusing on individual institutions, not society as a whole, and certainly focused on race mixing. Integration became the favorite term. Its scope was society-wide and implied a social, economic, and legal equality in all arenas of American life, public or private. It was soon used by black intellectuals and journalists, and by 1939, it had made its way to relatively out-of-the-way places like Chura. I would stress that the original supporters of racial integration were almost all African American. The term did not become widespread in the mainstream press until late in the war years and only took off really after 1945. But by, 19, by September 1941, a columnist for the Chicago Defender, a prominent black newspaper, Rebecca Stiles Taylor could write, the word integration has become so popular today, it has almost become a byword. If a Shakespeare wrote Taylor, to be or not to be is the question. The new question for the Negro was to integrate or not, or, or to integrate or to disintegrate. That is the question. And to integrate was the answer. She concluded, the time is now for Negroes to pull their strength and everything that is theirs for the proper recognition of their citizenship rights. Citizenship for Byrd, Taylor, and other early advocates of integration was more about just legal rights. It was a vision of active, dynamic, expansive citizenship, the entrance of African Americans into every arena of American life, public or private, formal, informal, as full equals. This is a return to an older notion of black citizenship. Steve Kantrowitz in audience today in his book, more than freedom has discussed how this broader notion of black citizenship animated antebellum black abolitionists such as David Walker, the great historian and religious thinker. Vincent Harding was fond of quoting the Colored People's Convention that met in Charleston um, in November 19, 1865, that among its demands called for the right to develop our whole being. This notion of an expansive citizen, black citizenship declined over the end of Reconstruction when the flight, fight for the bare minimum of legal citizenship was an all-consuming strike fight and largely not one that was being won. It was never entirely lost, but it came back, made a comeback in the 1930s. In that decade, there was a new emphasis on economic, social, and even psychological um, understanding of, of citizenship, both in the wider society and among African Americans. The 1930s were a decade when many Americans and many African Americans, whether from the vantage of the old left or the New Deal, saw the possibility of the radical transformation of basic American institutions as a real political possibility. Black political discourse became more outspoken, at most at once more optimistic and more despairing. Historians of what is often called the long civil rights movement in the 1930s and 40s had paid surprisingly little attention to the rise of integration as a political demand, both as word and idea, but integration became the shorthand term for a new and old vision of expanded black citizenship. There are a few more influential advocates of this version of racial integration in the middle decades of the 20th century than the religious thinker Howard Thurman, who is, I've spent a long time studying. In 1928, Thurman, then in his late 20s, was teaching a course on the life of Jesus at Spelman College in Atlanta at a time when he and his um, young women students found 
The racial climate so oppressive and affected us so intimately that analogies between Jesus' life as a Jew in a Roman world and ours was obvious. For Thurman, the main thing to know about the life of Jesus is that Jesus was not was a poor Jew and that he was not a Roman citizen. This meant, wrote Thurman, if a, if a Roman soldier pushed Jesus into a ditch, he could not appeal to Caesar. He would just be another Jew in a ditch. If one can be physically attacked with impunity, without consequences and recourse, then one is not a citizen. The right for effective citizenship and the fight against impunity um, for attackers continues in modern forms, such as the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement. Thurman relates that when a Sunday school teacher asked him, what did Daniel do in the lion's den? He replied, he didn't know, but he said Daniel probably spent most of his time trying to keep his eyes on the lion. <laughs> Citizenship starts with the knowledge that if someone pushes you into a ditch, there'll be consequences for the pusher. But for Thurman and Byrd and other supporters, early supporters of integration, this is only the floor of citizenship. It is what, what one does with this sense of security that makes for genuine citizenship. The ability to lead full creative lives by taking the full measure of the familiar Jeffersonian triad cited by Byrd, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For various reasons, it took two decades for Thurman to turn his ideas about Jesus and black citizenship into a book. In 1948, Carl Downs, president of Samuel Huston College in Austin, that Samuel Huston, an Iowa Methodist, and not Samuel Houston, the antebellum politician and slave owner, um, a historically black college in Austin, an admirer of Thurman, invited him to give a lecture series at his college. These lectures were published the following year as Jesus and the Disinherited. It was Thurman's most influential book, and it is said Martin Luther King always kept a copy with him on his travels. It might be a little apocryphal, but King, we know King read it because he plagiarized it in one of his student papers in his second year in grad school. Um, Carl Downs is little remembered today. When he became um, a college president in 1943, he was only 29 years old, supposedly the youngest college president in the United States. He died at the young age of 35. One admirer of Downs attributed um, his premature death to racism, a botched operation in a segregated Texas hospital. The same admirer wrote that in his abilities and dedication, he ranked with Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, and Martin Luther King Jr. Downs' one book, Meet the Negro, was published in 1943. As an example, it is an example of the new demand for in integration. It's a collection of 60 short biographical sketches of prominent African Americans. It was a demand for a new kind of black citizenship. It opens, America is deeply concerned about the Negro problem. It is pitifully brought blind to the Negro possibility. What black America wanted from whites was their cooperation and understanding, but not their pity and sympathy. For Downs, pity and racism was sort of like white America's good cop and bad cop. Thurman, Thurman often agreed and said, if a man can feel sorry for you, he can easily absolve himself of dealing with you in any sense as an equal. Um, integration opposed both white condescension and white racism. One person down did not include in Meet the Negro was the admirer quoted above, a person who in a few short years would become synonymous with integration and racial trailblazing, Downs' protege, Jackie Robinson, who grew up in Pasadena when Downs was pastor of its black Methodist church, becoming a mentor and surrogate father to the young Robinson. Robinson credited Downs with saving him from becoming a full-fledged juvenile delinquent and having him, helping him to face and come to terms with the racism he faced daily. They remained close. When Robinson faced a court-martial in Texas in 1944 over his resistance um, to segregated conditions on his army base, Robinson, um, one of the first persons he turned to was Downs. 
After leaving the Army, Robinson spent a few months as athletic director and basketball coach at Samuel Huston College. Later that year, Downs returned to Pasadena to officiate at the Robinson's wedding, at Jackie Robinson's marriage to Rachel. I hope everybody here knows the basic outlines of the story of Jackie Robinson, Branch Rickey, and the Brooklyn Dodgers, because I'm not going to retell it here. Um, if Rickey did much that was admirable, there's also much to criticize in how he hired Robinson. Rickey did not pay the Kansas City Monarchs, his Negro League team, for Robinson's contract. Rickey's famous comment, I'm looking for a player with the guts not to fight back, is part of a long pattern with break, in which the burden of breaking the color of gender barrier falls almost entirely on those challenging it. It also helped to confirm a pattern of integration as incrementalism, where the idea was the best way to challenge segregation was through seeding an all-white institution with a few extraordinarily well-qualified minority candidates waiting for change to percolate. It has a very mixed track record, whether in the case of Robinson, the Little Rock Nine, or for that matter, Harvey Gant entering Clemson as his first African-American student in 1963. I could add to the criticisms of Ricky, but let me make clear that he was the best that organized baseball had to offer. And without him, I don't know how long it would have been until there would have been black ball players in the major leagues. But even with Ricky, it would not be until 1959 that the Red Sox became the last team to sign a black ball player, while by 1950, the Negro Leagues were no longer functioning or playing on a major league level. There was an informal quota of black players on almost every team, um, which meant that while there were jobs for the Willie Mazes and Hank Aarons of the world, for more ordinary black, there was not for more ordinary black ball players. The first black coach, in the major leagues was not hired until 1962, the first black manager not until 1974, and the first black owner of a baseball team didn't happen until 2010. Um, and the Negro League had plenty of coaches, owners, and ma black managers. I don't think Robinson had any choice but to join the Dodgers. He certainly did not think he had an alternative. But inadvertently, Jackie Robinson's integration of major leagues had the perverse effect of helping to define integration down to a matter of entrance rather than equality, of race mixing as a goal rather than at best a byproduct and consequence of expanded black citizenship. Robinson and the black ball players that follow him joined organized baseball almost entirely on terms set by its white owners, destroying the Negro leagues in the process. Robinson's extraordinarily well-publicized breaking of baseball color line con contributed to a shift in the meaning of integration in the 1940s and 50s. But there were many other factors. Integration became seen by many of his new white supporters as a means to ameliorate the race problem rather than fighting for effective black citizenship. The Cold War certainly dulled some of integration's radical edge. For segregationists, such as Clemson grad Strom Thurmond, who did not practice what he preached, integration was simply race mixing and an assault on racial purity. On the other hand, there was a growing sense among many African Americans that integration, with examples like the Negro Leagues in mind, did little for blacks other than destroy black institutions, businesses, and hard-won black autonomy. But I would argue that the biggest factor influencing the understanding of integration in the 1950s and 60s was simply the difficulty of realizing it. Coming to terms what integration meant in a whole range of different political and social arenas. If there was relative success in some areas, such as the ending of segregation in the military, there was general failure in integration elsewhere, notably, notably in the closely li linked questions of integrated housing and public schools. Th this morning, Chris Spann's paper about um, the um, possible of federalization of education is something I was not really familiar with and it was fascinating and how different American history would have been if indeed um, education had become a federal institution and, you know, as long as we're 
putting counterfactual on counterfactual, that in the same way that Truman desegregated the military through executive order, he could have desegregated every school in the country by a similar means. Um, anyway, um, in the 1930s and 40s, integration was often a concrete political demand. By the 1950s, integration began to be seen by its defenders, black and white alike, as something less immediate and more of a process rather than a political program, one with a distant and perhaps receding goal. The term desegregation came into use in the early 50s because as one of the first persons to use the term in the journal, wrote in the Journal of Negro History in 1952, desegregation, that is the mere admission of Negro students to existing institutions for white people does not constitute integration. The term de facto segregation, referring to informal segregation patterns, especially in housing and education, first appeared in the mainstream press around 1956. All these problems aside, African American support for integration as effective black citizenship remained fairly solid through the mid 1960s. As late as 1964, 460,000 New York City school children participated in the one-day boycott called, led, called by the black-led New York Citywide Committee for Integrated Schools. Recognizing, recognizing that the demand of the boycott were for better schools for all black students and effective black citizenship for students and parents, an unlikely supporter of the boycott for integrated schools is Malcolm X. And if I can add, another supporter of this boycott was me, proudly representing Mrs. Elman's fourth grade class in PS57 in the Bronx. Um, but if we had seen, by 1967, even integration's most stalwart African-American supporters, such as Malcolm X, were on the defensive. For the most part, integration's advocates have been on the defensive ever since fending off challenges that integration was either too superficial a reform to challenge the reality of American race and racism or too much of a change to be realistically implemented. There is a large phenomenon on the phenomenon, large literature on the phenomena of integration exhaustion. If there's one reason why the ideal of integration has faded in recent decades, I would suggest that certainly in original form, it just seems too optimistic. Who now believes that America's basic institutions can be radically transformed for the better by demanding equality, genuine citizenship, and respect of personhood for all Americans? The integration's early supporters were not Pollyannas. They supported integration not because they thought it would be easy, but because they thought it was necessary. The least, wor the least worst of a range of bad political alternatives that African Americans faced in the 1930s. James Weldon Johnson, perhaps Du Bois' only rival for the title of the Grand Old Man of African Letters, in 1934 published a book-less res response to Du Bois' call for segregation titled Negro Americans, What Now? He argued that integration was necessary because all the other possibilities, and Johnson considered Du Bois' plan of segregation, notions of assimilation, amalgamation, the accommodationism, the accommodationism of Booker T. Washington, Garvey's vision of a return to Africa was the possibility of a Marxist revolution were all less likely of being realized in integration. Those like Du Bois who said integration was impossible in, race in, Amer in racist America were, in Johnson's words, apostles of the obvious. Calling on blacks to recognize that prejudice is an actuality is to place an emphasis on what has never been questioned. Perhaps we are returning to a similar juncture in the nation's history, like the 1860s or the 1930s, when dire events make radical transformation of our basic institutions both necessary and possible, and half measures utterly inadequate. In pointing out the great challenges this would face, we too should be wary of the apostles of the obvious. It does not mean being impractical or living in a cocoon of the like-minded, but it means the fight for integration, for political, economic, and social equality 
and what Howard Sherman called the equality of the infinite worth of every person for all Americans, legal citizens or not, remains essential to our democracy. Integration arose as a demand by African Americans in the 1930s, not because they thought that African Americans were making progress towards the goals of full citizenship, because they doubted it. And so I suggest there's never been a better time to rediscover the radical meaning of integration. This is certainly what Levi Byrd meant in 1939 when he called to integration in Chira, and what the members of the Color Convention in Charleston had in mind when they demanded the right to develop our whole being. No doubt many of the Charleston Convention saw this as part of their unfinished work. A century and a half later, it still is for all of us. We've got time for, for questions and comments. So. Go ahead. Uh, this is for Gerald. Uh, sometimes I think my tendency to be optimistic is purely perverse, uh, considering I've studied history for 30 years now. Uh, but I uh, think we're just designed one way or the other, and I can't help myself. So um, essentially, it's a f continuing the question I asked Bill earlier. Uh, the, um, at the end of the Civil War, Andrew Johnson took several measures, active measures, energetic measures, to block the Freedmen's Bureau in every attempt at land reform, uh, demoting, transferring uh, officers that promoted land reform, who protected uh, African Americans as they organized and tried to buy land of their own, uh, who tried to move African Americans towards land. Uh, pardoned all the Confederate officers, leaders, whose land Congress had confiscated to redistribute. Do you really think that he was uh, the same as what Lincoln would do? Because it strikes me that, you know, the way we look at Lincoln is that he was whipsawed between two values, right? Uh, an opportunity for African Americans to support themselves. The difference with Johnson is that there was no whip Let's see if this is, this is on. Yeah. Uh, I do think that there would have been a difference between Lincoln and Johnson. There is there's obviously no, no, no equivalence. Uh, and obviously, I'm getting into fact, counterfactual his, history where, where there are no footnotes, uh, obviously. Uh, you know, I think it's a matter of degree. Uh, uh, and a matter of nuance. It's not that Lincoln is, I, I'm not arguing that, that Lincoln is on this side and that Johnson is on this side, but well, that Johnson is on this side and Lincoln is probably closer to the middle. In other words, what, what happens uh, when, when the, the southern states uh, pass the black coats and, and Lincoln is alive? Let's, let's say, what, what happens there? What does he do? Uh, uh, you could make the argument that the black codes would not have been passed because he had a, he was, he was much more skilled politically, obviously. But what if they had been passed? What would he have done? He obviously would have gone in a very different direction than, than Andrew Johnson. Uh, would he have become what we call a radical Republican? Uh, uh, that we don't know. But I'm, I'm certainly not saying that, that, that it didn't matter whether Johnson or, 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 or Lincoln was, was in the White House. But again, we're in counterfactual land, so. Yeah. It had pretty, pretty much understood integration but now I'm perplexed. Do you think that, hmm? You didn't hear that? You didn't hear, no. Say it again. I, I thought I understood what there was, what was important about integration and the whole struggle for integration. 
but now I'm a bit perplexed by your last comment um, that maybe integration, that there, there must be something else more than integration that's important um, if we're all to respect our individual humanity. That something, something is amiss, something is off kilter. Uh, am I misunderstanding you? Well, I, I got in interested in this when I was reading various things from particularly the 1930s, and there was a long discussion of integration in the black press and black intellectuals. And what they were not really talking about was blacks in public schools necessarily. They were not talking about um, the way integration generally, I think, has come to be understood, that I think they saw those things as a byproduct of what they really wanted, which was full, effective, genuine black citizenship. And that breaking down the segregated barriers would be a consequence of integration and not its purpose. And I think that meaning, for reasons that I suggested quickly in the paper, tended to be lost in the 50s and 60s. And there's a history of integration that I think has been neglected by scholars. Uh, I'd like to stay with Gerald. Um, I'm trying to remember who told me this many years ago. It may have been Dan Carter. That you can make a case that in 1865, the Southern elite was prepared for the worst and was powerless to resist whatever the worst might have been in their eyes. And it was only this sort of bungling of Johnson and the mixture of uh, congressional politics that uh, allowed them to gain a little more self-confidence in, in, in uh, standing up to the Yankees in the way that they ended up doing. Just, just talk about counterfactuals. How, how does that sound to you? Uh, it sounds plausible, but, but and, and probably more than plausible, certainly a road that could have been taken. But Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I usually talk so loud that uh, my, uh, my, my colleagues across the hall tell me to when I'm in a classroom, so I usually don't need this. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think that most Southerners would draw the line at, at land redistribution, and that's really what I'm focused on here, that kind of economic redistribution. Uh, political redistribution is obviously controversial, but I think economic redistribution in America is sort of where the rubber meets the road, and I think there, there, there would have been strife in the post, post-bellum South uh, uh, if any serious land redistribution program had been, had been implemented. I'm not saying that it should not have been implemented. Uh, I'm just saying that, that if there was such a program, there might have been uh, a tremendous amount of strife. And, I guess, again, to get back into the counterfactual, I don't know whether Lincoln, had he lived, would have had the stomach for, for a second civil war. But you're right, that, that, is, that, is, that is a possible path uh, as well, that with a stronger and more focused uh, and uh, wiser, if, if we can, that's not always a historical term, but wiser chief executive, uh, uh, that, that road could have possibly been a, a road. You mentioned that the uh, Confederate leader's land was confiscated. I don't know a lot about that. Can you just tell me the details of what you mean by confiscated? What was the understanding of when that land was being held? Um, how, what percentage of the land was it? Well, I'm not the land, the expert. I'm looking right at him right, right now. Uh, 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 le just because land is confiscated by the federal government doesn't mean that it is necessarily redistributed to, to the freedmen. I mean, that's, that's really it in a, in a nutshell. 
And what Johnson does, uh, President Johnson, with his, with his pardon policy, is he makes it possible for the vast majority of former Confederates to, you know, to keep their land. Now, even if they lost their land, there's still not a, a guarantee that land would end up in the hands of the freedmen. That, that's the purpose of the Freedmen's Bureau, at least in part, was to to make, a, make land available, not to give land to the free people, but to make it available to them. Uh, and that doesn't happen either. And I guess I'm arguing that uh, uh, aside, aside from the fact that the Confederates or human beings are just not willing to give up their gains even if they're ill-gotten, uh, there's a culture uh, in the United States at that time and at this time of property rights. Uh, uh, and uh, respect and perhaps over respect for property rights and it just would have been very difficult but I will I will I will defer to the expert uh, my questions for professor Spencer thank you for your talk uh, and I just wanted you to kind of educate us why do you feel the history literature on the anti-war movement is so whitewashed, uh, just more generally. Okay, thank you for, for asking. I believe that the history of the movement against the Vietnam War, and even if you do something as simple as look in Google and you Google peace movement, for example, um, you're not gonna see too many uh, faces of color. Despite the fact when you speak to almost anyone who was involved in civil rights or any kind of activism at the time, they will talk to you about the draft and turning 18 and what it meant for their high school and um, how serving in the war had an impact on them as soldiers as well. I think it's because the movement history has been so compartmentalized and I think that is because the there's been kind of a limiting of the boundaries around the black freedom movement, really writing it into United States boundaries and not thinking about how a lot of global events had an impact on the black freedom movement and vice versa. So for example, the Tet Offensive, right, which had such a huge impact around the world, had a huge impact on the anti-war movement, is not really seen as a part of the black story in the 1960s, which really centers around Dr. King's speech coming out against the Vietnam War and, Martin, uh, and uh, Muhammad Ali's draft resistance. Uh, behind those two men's stories are the stories of so many organizations, grassroots organizations led by women. There's a great book called Radicals on the, um, on the Road by Judy Wu, who looks at Robert Spann Brown, um, who was uh, African American, who was talking about the Vietnam War in the 1950s. So it's a long history and I feel like uh, what I found in my work um, looking again, looking at black anti-war activism is that one has to start really earlier than, and not follow the timeline of US military intervention. So for example, connecting the US invasion of the Dominican Republic to anti-war activism, connecting the Cuban Revolution, the Mau Mau Rebellion, the Bandung Conference, the Korean War, to a growing sense of black internationalism and growing critique of the global order. And then Vietnam becomes part of that larger story. Okay, my question is about integration it, in the public school system. Well, it's starting all over again, uh, especially in the South. I don't know about any other areas of the country, but the schools are becoming segregated. And I mean, it looks almost like it did in 1967. It's beginning to look like that uh, when I was in the midst of the height of integration. So what do you say about integration at this point in time, and especially as it affects the public school system? Well, I, I, I guess I would say is that the one legacy of the civil rights movement is that blacks never got the full citizenship that they were seeking. 
and that, as I suggested, to the extent that the thought was that putting blacks and whites together in a classroom would create citizenship with doing it backwards. It seems to me that citizenship and effective power has to come first. And, and you know, and, and of course, you, you, can't you can't separate integration in public schools from segregation and housing patterns. The, the two were extraordinarily closely linked. And the um, United States has never seriously dealt with either. Certainly, it has not dealt with segregated housing patterns, as you suggested earlier, what happened in, in, in Greenville. And um, that, you know, as, as I suggested, I think integration is, with, with, is calling for a more radical transformation of the basic institutions of American society. And to the extent people thought that um, changing school patterns would solve a bigger problem, it was mistaken. Go ahead. I didn't want to monopolize time, so I wanted other people to get questions in. But a 30-second response to you is that Congress did pass legislation to confiscate land from uh, men who had sworn uh, an oath to defend the Constitution, meaning high military and federal officials, and then who had taken a leading role uh, in the Confederacy. There was enough land that would have been confiscated because these men were almost entirely large planters to have distributed land to the freedmen, 40 acres and a mule wise. This happened immediately after the Civil War when the South was most uh, unable to fight back. Uh, so it's before the Klan rises, before all that happens. Uh, uh, I think at one point Eric Foner suggested that uh, they would have been vulnerable to attack, though, these farms. The, but the way I see it, these plantations were large, and so African Americans would have been centralized on land of their own, which apparently is what they wanted when they talked to Sherman, land apart from white folk uh, to get back to integration, which would have made it much easier to protect them by the army and by the Freedmen's Bureau. So I do see it as something that land reform was foiled by a very successfully activist, uh, aggressive white supremacist president. And I don't think Lincoln was going to be a highly activist white supremacist president. Uh, so I think it would have been possible. It just... John I, guess, I guess if this was going to be possible, it had to be in 1865 itself. Yeah, right. That's, yeah. Right. Right. That's the moment. It's about the timing yeah. and about centralizing land. Right. That, that it would have been large communities where we find later on African Americans were the least likely to be lynched. That's the right. study that, right. that, that Tony totally and Bailey so they, came out they with. They could have been in a position to protect themselves. They would not have been scattered. So, so history has its moments, and that moment was 1865. And history is now the word for the past. Right. That's fine. Is this our to thank the panelists?